if people want to know me better, they could listen to me. And then like, if, and then like if I was right next to somebody and they're like, hey, look, it's Joe. I know all about you. I was in second grade with you and listening to you in council. That's why I think council is so beautiful because it's such a natural experience. It's a social experience. It honors people, their stories. It has its roots in all culture. I, I think if council was never to be in, in this high school, I don't think I would have got to know my friends or teachers close. It wouldn't have been that bond that we have now. Um, council is like, it just opens you up to a, a whole new like level of love and companionship towards other people. I think one of the big challenges we have in our society is that we're all so busy and the pace is so fast that it's rare that we really get to sit down and listen to another human being face to face, fully focused on them. I'll talk back to teachers and I didn't like being in class. And ever since council, it's like I like being in class. I respect my teachers. I talk to my teachers way better and I get respect back from them and I like, really like it a lot. Each time we have counsel, somebody shares something that we didn't know before. And we just become closer and closer when each story is shared. And I think that's good to have in a place where most people are like, don't want to talk to you, just got to get through this, blah, 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 fast, fast, fast. We need to slow down and talk to each other more instead of just text. The use of the talking piece is what distinguishes counsel from other forms of dialogue or debate certainly or uh, discussion even because when you have the talking piece you know that you aren't going to be interrupted not only by people's words but by their thoughts because we are practicing the art of receptivity we're practicing not forming our opinion about whatever is being said and when a student knows that they are so much freer to be able to explore new ideas or tell a story that they might not have even thought of before. Well, you get to talk and listen, and it just makes the other kids feel good when you listen to other kids, because they feel like what they're saying is very important. They share stories with me, and it also gives me the opportunity to show them that I am a human being, that I also have stories as well. There was one girl that outside should always be mean to me, and then once we got to council, I was like, wow. I guess she has a hard life and she gets very grouchy sometimes because of all her stress. So now I know why she's like that outside. Something that is, it just continuously is lacking in education is those personal relationships and teaching our young people how to be social and how to stand up for what they believe in and how to communicate their ideas to others and it seems to be missing more and more and we're getting rid of the arts and we're getting rid of the music and and that that area that they can express themselves in it just seems to be disappearing and this is something that counsel something that can do worlds for the students and the adults in the classroom um, personally and also academically fundamentally counsel is a practice that supports the basic skills of listening and speaking. And these underlie the skills of reading and writing. What is reading but listening from the heart to the story of another? And what is writing but feeling that you have a story to tell in the listening of others? In this way, counsel is the basis of all other academic skills. Do you learn from the Chinook? No, we learn from each other. Well, how do we learn from each other? through talking, through sharing ideas, and that's, you know, just um, counsel's a perfect vessel for that. So teachers are challenged to bring relevance into their classrooms, that is to connect the curriculum to the lived experience of the children. Council promotes this relevance by asking students to tell their own stories of experiences with the water cycle with conflict that they might see in social studies, with the themes of love and loss that they might encounter in literature. When counsel is a regular practice in a school or classroom community, students want to come to school because they never know what's going to happen in counsel that day. Uh, their, their classmates might tell stories that are silly or funny or sad or stories of adventures they've had, and it activates their curiosity. I hear students say stuff like, Wow, this is a bomb school, which means, you know, this is an, a, a great school. I've never been at a school like this before. 
or I, you guys really care about us. Now, how would they know that if it weren't for counsel? And I'll be like, oh, that's the teacher that's, that I know from counsel, and he's been through the things I've been through. He's a, he's a teacher. He's a human being like I am. I'm here only twice a week, but when I'm not here, they know who else has their back. I pretty much give a lot of credit to counsel because in that forum, they feel safe with one another. Thank you for always being a good friend and always helping me in P and in my classes. The most powerful experience may uh, come f uh, to those students who don't say anything at all. Just by being in the circle, uh, by hearing other people's story, by being able to have that empathic sort of experience. I've been at councils where uh, people are so moved by somebody else's story, people will start crying because we all felt the same thing. We were all talking about one thing and we all saw that in our own lives and we were like, oh my God, you know, we, we all feel the same way. There was just such an exchange of stories that connected these young people. By the end of it, they themselves decided that the world needs to have an opportunity to sit in council. And they made a commitment to one another to, to remain friends no matter what happens in their lives. Oh, I know I'm gonna keep it going. <laughs> That's my goal, to keep doing council for as long as I can. We need to do way more in this 21st century than just teaching them how to read and write and add and subtract. We need to teach them how to be people who can listen and appreciate other stories because if we don't do that, we are never going to make it. To me, what council does is to deeply reconnect us to one another, to look into each other's eyes, to see the reaction on our faces when we are telling our story, and to understand that we are much more alike than we are different, and to really reconnect us, to reconnect us to ourselves, understand who we are, so we're not looking at the inputs coming at us, we're connecting with another human soul. That's what, that's what really makes a difference right now. Kate Lipkiss has been working in communication dynamics for more than 40 years. She is a former award-winning advertising copywriter, home birth midwife's assistant, and environmental activist. She discovered council in 1999 when it was a regular practice at her daughter's middle school. Soon she was faci facilitating in the classroom. As a certified trainer, mentor, and council consultant with council and schools, she helped establish council to new audience, establish programs in five public schools in the Los Angeles Unified School District, as well as introducing council to new audience at the annual Bioneers Conference in Northern California through the Center for the Council's Social Justice Foundation and during weekend trainings in the US and in Australia. At her home in Venice, she offers monthly circles for practitioners and the Council Curious, and runs several programs that use the Universal Medicine Wheel as a framework for navigating our individual and collective journeys. Kate has lived in Australia, England, and the United States, and has traveled extensively in Europe and Southeast South East Asia. She has grown two. She has two grown children whose life work and passion embrace the council practice they were introduced to in their formative years. So Kate's trying to show everyone how council helps people with communication. We were both nervous. <laughs> well. John Savannah, fantastic. So, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, yes, I am Kate, and I am a carrier of a practice called Council. 
When we sit in council together, we sit in a circle. And the most important place in that circle is the center. The center supports our practice and it's where we focus as we listen compassionately to the colleagues and friends that are in the circle with us. And just like a hammer is always looking for a nail, I'm always looking for connections to council. So what do we have here? Where are we located geographically? Now, I've just flown in from Los Angeles via Australia and Bali, so I'm really not sure where I am, but we know where we are, I think. Let me move this out of the way. Ding! That means change slides. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Nelson, according to the, con the conference website, is the geographic center of New Zealand, right? And again, there we go, good. And I believe from the conference program that we are almost exactly halfway through this inspiring gathering, right? So you and I are in the center right now. All right, good. So the practice that I'm about to introduce you to is central to the theme and the promise of this conference, as far as I can see. So the promise of the conference, what is it? It is to, for us to engage in a multitude of hands-on, heartfelt approaches to creative and collaborative educational activities in an environment of trust, equality, and enjoyment. So I'm looking at these words, engage, and hands-on, and heartfelt. We've got to be heartfelt. We're going to be creative at this conference, and we're going to collaborate together, and we're going to trust each other as we do so, and we're going to do it in a way that really proves to us that we are on an equal playing ground, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Sounds an awful lot like council to me. <laughs> so what is council? What is it? Well, it's a process, not a program. It's storytelling, not therapy. It's a community building practice. And council values stories rather than opinions. I think our little um, PowerPoint is going to do a little fancy thing here, which I'll just let it do, and then we'll go to the next slide. So the next slide, yeah, there we go, thank you. So council is a process. Um, often teachers might say to me, look, I don't have time for anything else. I'm so busy with everything I already have to do, I can't add one more thing. Council is actually, it doesn't come with its own predetermined content. It's a context for creating more meaningful, engaging content. So it's a template, it's an overlay on what's already happening in the classroom. Thank you. It's storytelling, it's not therapy. So while children may describe council as a place where they can express their feelings, one of the major goals is to help children access their stories so they know why they feel what they feel. So while it's not therapy, an active council practice in a classroom may work to help children feel heard and to experience that their need for simple attention is being met. Boom. I've never done PowerPoint before, you guys, so thank you for being patient with us. Great. Uh, while we may work in the same building and eat in the same lunchroom, how well do I know my colleagues? When faculty sits in council over time, my colleagues become more three-dimensional simply because I know what makes them come alive or I know about the challenges that they've faced in their life. I'm more invested in their success and in my relationship with them, ultimately for the good of the students that we all serve, right? And when I sit in council with my students, the classroom ultimately becomes a more cohesive learning space. Council values stories, not opinions. Opinion, according to Joe Provisor, who you saw on the, uh, the video, who was my mentor, Opinion is story robbed of its narrative. We're all overflowing with opinions about sports teams or political parties or food or the ways to raise children or why we can't stand our mother-in-law or Christmas or the snow or foreigners, on and on and on and on. For every opinion we have, there's a story hiding behind it. 
It's the story that led us to that opinion. So I'm interested in hearing your story, and I'm interested in you hearing your story as well. If I'm ever going to budge from an entrenched position that I have, it's likely going to be because of the story of another person that causes me to reevaluate where I stand. So what is this council business? Okay, stop right there for just a second, and I'm going to go through these one, one thing at a time, although I've got a feeling that a lot of you do this already. So we call it simple because it looks simple, and also it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. So we start with a circle, and um, I'm often talking with teachers who'll say, well, I'll put the kids in a circle, and I'll stay in my chair. And I go, no, 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 no. If you can't get down, and they say, oh, I've got bad knees. I've got bad knees too. I'll, I'll make it work. And if, if the teacher can't get down on the floor, I'll say, well, let's bring the kids up. Let's have the children sitting in chairs as well. Let's all be equal. And it has a center. We like to make it a beautiful centerpiece. So we bring things that are meaningful to us. The children bring things that are meaningful to them. We start with a centerpiece cloth, which is beautiful. Maybe we'll put something from nature in the middle. We might have uh, a bell so that we can start. Uh, we have talking pieces. Okay, what do we have next? A way to open. So um, a bell or a chk 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 or dropping pebbles into a bowl of water. Something that will make a sound so that we can open our space together. We've stepped over a threshold and now we're going to speak to each other and listen in a way that's different to what we do in our usual life. Talking piece. It's called a talking stick. I prefer the word piece, so that we're not having to have this stick. We can have anything that is meaningful to us in the circle that we can pick up and use as a piece. There are four intentions to counsel. They're not rules. They're intentions. They're things we're aiming for. And I'm still a long way from being um, copacetic with the intentions of counsel. The first intention, thing we try to do, is to listen from the heart. Well, what does that mean? It means that we're attempting to listen without judgment. And not only negative judgment, but positive judgment. Or, oh, I like what that person's wearing. I like what they're saying. I'm thinking, What's gonna, what am I going to say when I get the talking piece? Mm -mm -mm. Listen from the heart. Just pay attention. Give positive regard to the person that has the piece at that time. Next, we try to speak from the heart. And what does that mean? Well, I'm up here on a stage right now, and I'm kind of a little bit in performing mode, which makes me very uncomfortable. Um, sometimes people will use the talking piece as if it's a microphone. Like they're on stage, they're presenting, they've got a point that they want to get across. Um, maybe they're trying to make us laugh. Now, often there are stories that do make us laugh in council, but not for its own sake, not laughter for its own sake or for performance. And um, speaking from the heart also means to be authentic with what's happening right now, what comes up as we get the piece. So the third is to speak spontaneously. If we're really, really paying attention to that first one, listening from the heart, then we're not planning what we're going to be saying. So when we actually get the talking piece, that's a moment where we stop. Oh, what's true for me right now? What is it that wants to be spoken? So we try for spontaneity. And the fourth is to speak leanly. If we were all to sit in a circle right now, and we had an hour, we'd probably have like a second each to speak. This is not usually the size that we would have a council. But if you look around the room and you're in council and you think, okay, I know that the bell is going to ring in so many minutes. Here's how many people need to speak. Maybe I just need to cut the fat off what I'm saying. Speaking leanly doesn't mean necessarily speaking briefly, but it does mean that we just say what it is that we want to say and then we move on. We allow someone else to speak. <clears throat> so, um, thank you, Jay. Next. This is a practice that is not... Oh, I'm sorry. 
One more. And acknowledging, a couple more actually, yeah. And acknowledging expression. So the acknowledging expression is something that um, allows us to say, yes, I agree with you 100%, or you're speaking for me, my brother speaks for me, my sister speaks for me. Instead of interrupting and saying that, we'll use some sort of acknowledgement. I might say, aho, which is short for ahomatakweyasen, which means, basically, in Lakota means all my relations. Yes, I agree with you, amen, thank you, all of those things. Um, it lets the other person know that we're with them. Um, sometimes we will um, we'll do this, or we'll do this. We're speaking the same, we're thinking the same. The kids like to do this, a little twinkle. Yeah. But it, it prevents everyone from talking when this person actually has the peace. Yeah. Um, witnessing. After we've had our circle, we'll often have a witnessing round. And this is the opportunity for us to reflect on what has stayed with us from what's been said. So it's not about, oh yeah, I heard that person, that person's my friend, so I'm gonna say what it is that I heard them say. But what's actually staying with us from what's been said? And that is another way that we can really say we're mirroring, we're really listening to what is in the circle, and it helps us to look at what a th maybe what theme is arising from the circle. And a way to close. So we've opened our circle with a dedication, We've made some sort of a sound. We may have dedicated to a person or a, a thing or a feeling. When we make the sound, we say, I dedicate this council to something. And we like to have a way to close. So we'll do so with uh, a clap that we pass around, a simultaneous clap. Uh, we'll hold hands, pass a pulse. These things I'm sure are familiar to you, a foot stomp and children make up ways to close all the time that are way more creative than anything that I can ever think of. So those are kind of the elements of a council and you can see it's really formal, it's really structured and within that structure, as so often is the case, we have the freedom to be able to uh, speak uh, in a way that, um, that is vulnerable. So the final thing is that we make an agreement. Do we have one more? Yes. An agreement for confidentiality. So uh, one way is just to say what's said in circle stays in circle. Um, certainly you can go out into the playground and you can talk about the fact that we had a council, here are the people that were in our council. You may want to mention, oh yeah, we talked about bullying. And you know, we, we spoke about you know, when we've been bullied and also about times when we might have bullied someone. But we don't connect a particular story to a person. I wouldn't say, oh, Jay spoke about the time that, you know, he bullied somebody in his class or that sort of thing. So that's, that's confidentiality. Now, of course, kids are gonna break that. Of course, they're gonna break it. And when they break it, that's the opportunity to come into council and talk about what it's like when someone betrays our confidence. So we get to explore humanity over and over again when we sit in this practice. All right. So next slide. Um, yeah, I just wanted to just point out some, I'm sure that there is a, a Maori equivalent as well. There are so many dialogic practices where we sit, not necessarily in a circle, but we're sitting with these, um, these pieces that are kind of in our DNA. Council's not a new idea. Council circles are being formed every day in schools all over the world and in prisons and homes and community organizations and businesses. So it really is in our DNA and it's in our bones and when we sit, it's a process of just remembering. So here are some of the ways and the next slide shows even more in our scientific and educational and business communities that people are sitting in uh, a mindful dialogue. And often I find that those who are sitting in council for the first time will end up in tears. And um, it seems that the emotion of remembering can be too much to contain and happily the tears can be contained in that circle. That feeling of like, I know what this is. Somewhere in me, this feels like I'm coming home. 
Mm. Next slide. Three sources of council curriculum. So let's look at the first. Based on the teacher's reading of the interactive field, all kinds of, oh, yes, next slide. I'm sorry, thank you. The teacher's reading of the interactive field. So, council can be used whenever a teacher senses a shift in the classroom or school community. And you can just um, bring these up just, just you know, as, as you want, Jay. Maybe something's happened out in the playground. Let's have a council. A test has come and gone. So let's talk about how it was for us in council. Oh, it's somebody's birthday. We can have a birthday council. And everyone can give an imaginary gift to the special child. Lest we forget, tell about a time we forgot or remembered something or someone. Um, the, uh, the morning after 9-11, as it's called in America, after the World Trade Center was bombed, the school where um, my children, you can, yeah, just bring, I think there's three more, you can just bring those up. Um, the school where uh, my kids were, every single classroom was sitting in council. So the teachers knew not to, uh, not to just move on with the school day. They knew that everyone was coming to school with something on their mind that they needed to speak about. And so council is used in this way. Um, I was uh, working at a, a school one time where there was a stabbing outside on the street after school. And the next morning, the principal said, um, you know, over the loudspeaker, anyone who witnessed the stabbing or is feeling really affected by the stabbing right now, just know that there's a counselor. You can go and speak to the counselor. And the kids heard counselor and thought, council, and they went to the uh, person who was supervising on the playground, which always happens in Los Angeles, there's always a, a teacher supervising with a walkie-talkie, and said, Miss, can we have a council? And they sat right down there in a circle, they used the walkie-talkie as a talking piece, and they spoke about times when there'd been violence in their life. You know, this was a pretty, I wouldn't say, a, well, a rough school kids weren't rough, was in a rough neighborhood, and there were children whose fathers had been involved in some sort of violence, or you know, maybe the uncle was in prison, something had happened, or something had happened to him. So it gave them the opportunity right then to deal with that, rather than to just shush, we're in school now, we've got to get on with it. So teachers are really good at uh, reading the field anyway, and um, this is another, it's another tool in the toolkit for when you have those moments. So teachers also use it for, um, you know, how, how are we doing so far this year with that goal or with this goal? Let's pass a talking piece and talk about it. So the next way is what students want to know. All right, let's put those up. Let's see how many of them are. Oop, no, back, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Three, not as many as what the teachers have, right? <laughs> <laughs> so here's what the students want to know. Students love to check in. Let's just do a check in, see how everyone's feeling. Let's do a weather report. So we go around and talk about, well, I'm feeling fine, but there's a few clouds on the horizon, or I'm feeling particularly rainy today. Or we'll check in with just a sound. Or, or just one word. That's an easy way to find out what's going on with your students. The second is a whole process of finding out what the kids want to talk about. So often teachers will come up with some sort of a prompt for counsel and hot potato, hot potato, hot potato. Nobody really wants to talk about that because it's boring because it's what the teacher wants us to talk about, not what we want to talk about. So we go through a whole process of um, finding out what is alive and juicy for our students. What are they talking about out in the playground? What are they talking about when they're on their phone or texting with their friends? And we write these down as themes. We say, yeah, sex, anyone talk? Oh, 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 oh. Girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever it is, we write it all down and we work on prompts from the themes of what the children want to talk about. And then we've got 
endless councils that the children can address. And it's about things that matter to them rather than the things that we think matter. Because really, the principle is to connect in a circle and talk. It's not necessarily about the content of the circle always, but about the fact that we're connecting and really listening from the heart to each other's stories. Gender councils are uh, a sort of a binary way of doing a council where perhaps we separate into boys and girls and the girls will go off and just brainstorm about a question that they can give to the boys. Something that is completely mysterious to girls about boys. So then we come in and we do what's called a fishbowl council. So we'll have a smaller circle in the middle, or well, not necessarily smaller, but a middle circle, and all the boys will go in there, and the girls will be in an outer circle in that kind of fishbowl situation as witnesses. So here's the prompt. They'll present the prompt to the boys. The boys answer it. Wow, I'm a fly on the wall of a whole bunch of boys talking about this thing. I'm quiet, I'm listening. And they've got their own little circle going. So then it's witnessed by the girls. Switch it. So then the girls go in the middle. Maybe the boys are saying, you know, what is it that means that you take as much time as you do to get ready or something? Or what do you do when you get home from school or something, any, whatever it is that they've worked out. And so they present that prompt and the girls do it and the boys listen and then the boys witness. Just one way, just one tiny little way to get a window on the world of the other gender. That's a gender council. Okay, next slide. The third source of council curriculum is academic application. So um, this is where I began and I said, you know, teachers don't have time to put something else there. Council can be used to actually reach your own academic goals, accessing prior knowledge. I don't know how you do that right now, but um, name one thing you know before we launch into this lesson about cell growth. Donk, da, donk, da, donk, da, donk, da, donk. You get to see what they already know about that. Oh, I don't have to teach that because they already know that thing. Or maybe they know things that you weren't planning to put into the lesson. It's a really good check-in to see uh, where you're starting from. Attitudes as well. So um, one thing you know about multiplication or Shakespeare. Okay, what about, what comes to mind when I say the word long division? Or yeah, I like to do that. So you can find out where they are attitudinally before you start the lesson. And then checking for acquired knowledge. Okay, you've done the lesson. And they all got it, right? Let's see if they all got it. Following week, maybe you say, as we go around, as the talking piece comes around the circle, please just name one thing you remember on our lesson from last week on the water cycle. Oh, maybe I have to do that lesson again. Or maybe they all get it. Apart from anything else, this is a way for them to hear it through their peers' mouths instead of hearing it always from the teacher. So they, they, it's, uh, it's also a way of um, revision. So they've already heard it once from you, they're hearing it again. And there might be huge gaps. This is the opportunity for you to fill in the gaps or afterwards. And then text of connections in all disciplines. Um, poetry councils, um, what Martin Luther King Day in America. Let's speak about a time when we felt that things were unfair for us. So ways for children to connect with whatever the subject matter is by telling a story about their own experience of that thing. Next slide. So council is more than talk. Here are some of the ways that we can incorporate council into classrooms and into schools. Uh, movement and dance councils. We have, um, I'm just going to sort of jump around a little bit in this list. There's something called a gesture story council. And so we may say uh, something that happened between the time you got up and right now. 
So the child might just do a gesture. We say, just do a gesture. Don't tell the story about it. Just do the gesture. So uh, maybe the kid will go. And then each kid will do the gesture all the way around the circle. And then the second time we go around, we do the gesture. And oh, and then, for, and then sorry, after that first round, each, each other person in the circle is mirroring the gesture. So you see it done, and then everybody all together mirrors the gesture. And the second time around, the student will add the story. Well, I was in the bathroom and I was cleaning my teeth, and suddenly someone burst in and said I had to leave because they wanted to have a shower. So they do the gesture again, everyone does the gesture, and on around the circle. And then the third round is just gestures. So we forget the story, and we go around one at a time doing the gestures. There's one cleaning your teeth, another one's playing basketball, another one's you know, in the car running to school, another one's walking to school, another one, whatever it is. We do it like a, it's, it becomes like a dance. I always feel like if someone walked in at that moment, they'd go, wow, look at this great new improvisational dance going on. It's a great way to remember stories as well. There's something about bringing it into our body that helps us to remember what's gone on. So that's an example of uh, how we bring movement and kind of dance in. Sound and rhythm councils, rhythm sticks. A lot of people have rhythm sticks. We also use our body to create sound. And uh, I might start with one rhythm, rhythm, and the next person will put another rhythm onto my rhythm. And we go around, and we have an entire orchestra of body music going on. And then one by one at a time, they drop off until we just have one left. That's the hardest. Everyone wants to stop at once. Um, pass the art. That's a great counsel. Uh, and an example, I love to tell, <laughs> tell these things in story, of course, it's really anecdotal. Uh, a teacher who was really upset with um, the uh, invasion of personal space that was going on in her classroom. She'd hear stories about what was happening on the yard. and. Um, so she gave every child a piece of blank paper and uh, a crayon, colored pencil. And we worked this where uh, we had a bell and she gave the kids maybe five seconds at the most to do some sort of gesture, some writing, not, not writing, but um, something artistic, a curve, a line on the piece of paper. Ring the bell, bing, pass it and get the next one. Oh, what have I got here? Okay, adding to that. Ring the bell, bing, on around the circle until each child got their own piece back. Now, in that, in that sort of classroom, can you imagine what she was seeing or what, what was going on? There were a couple of kids who every piece of paper they got. <coughs> next one. <coughs> so, bunch of upset children. And she said, this is what I see going on here. And then they went into council about respect and about uh, being compassionate with other people. Um, because they experienced it right then in the moment. It wasn't, oh yeah, I heard this thing happen and blah, 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 and I'm going to teach you, you know, shut down. It got recreated in the classroom. Oh, I want to tell you about another uh, kinesthetic one. It's a game called Whoosh. Games for me are just really openers for councils. This one's a great one. I have a ball in my hand and I'm going to pass it. Whoosh, 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 all the way around with the sound. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. And then maybe it gets back to me. I go bonk. Now it goes the other way. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. Someone goes bonk and it has to go back this way. Whoosh, 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 bonk. Whoosh, whoosh, bonk. Whoosh, whoosh, bonk. And then these guys over here are just having the time of their lives, right? These guys over here are like... <laughs> so we finished this game. There's a whole lot of other interstate and you know, all these other things you can do in this game. But as uh, a demonstration, just this little thing that happened. We sit down, we have a council. What just happened? Or what was that like? Not how do you feel about it. It's not real. It doesn't have to be about feelings. But what was that like? Well, it was great fun. I loved it. It was really fun, you know? These guys over here are like... I was really boring. I never got it. I never got it. So right there, you've got a council about inclusivity and exclusivity. Tell about a time when you were able to 
bring in the new kid in school. Tell about a time when you felt like you were excluded and no one wanted to spend time with you or play with you. So bringing um, games in and giving the children an experience of what's happening right in the moment and then allowing the story to come out can sometimes be a more effective way than just lecturing them about appropriate behavior. Hmm. Uh, poetry appreciation. I just mentioned that a little before. It's one of my favorite councils just because I like poetry and a lot of children have a hard time accessing poetry. Um, find a poetry with lots of imagery and just read it. Allow people to relax, have them sit back, just let the poem, just read the poem once and then have everyone stand up and if you're using chairs or cushions, away from the cushions and chairs and ask the children to listen again for the place where they pay attention or where they find that they go unconscious in the poem. And when that time comes, that they take a place in the circle. Starting, you know, choose a seat. We're going to start here. Anyone who, if it's at the beginning of the poem, will sit down and sequentially we're going to mark the poem all the way around the circle until everyone is sitting down. So here is a visual representation of if not the whole poem, huge pieces of the poem are right there through these images. Okay, we'll open council. Tell about a time in your life that that piece reminds you of. The place in the council where, in the, I'm sorry, in the poem where you perked up and started to pay attention or the place where you noticed that you went unconscious. And often it's a really big thing for those children. Often it's not, it might be just a visit to grandma's place and, uh, you know, yeah, she had uh, those flagstones on her driveway with the grass that's growing through them. Um, this is a poem called Of All Things by Bertolt Brecht that I'm particularly fond of that has lots of images. But you'll, you'll know them, you know those poems already, I'm sure. And then once all the stories are out and we've had maybe a witnessing round and everyone's really, really... Um, listen to the stories, just read the poem again and then ask the children, is this poem a little richer now for us? It's a great example of text to self. So these these uh, poems that can be so abstract, once we connect with images and connect with stories in our lives, that's when that other dimension opens up for us in a poem. How are we going here? Oh, good, all right. So, um, I just thought we'd just try and do a few councils. I'm really not comfortable talking about this practice. You know, this is like triangle learning. I'm up here, I'm supposedly know all the stuff and you guys are down there having to learn all the stuff. It's not my favorite way. But um, I'd like to um, invite you to be part of our having Four councils in five minutes. Do you reckon we can do it? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, right. So, uh, we're going to have four councils. And excuse me for reading this. This is something that my mentor Joe does, and I love it, and uh, I want to learn it. So, we're all guinea pigs together in this one. We're going to have four councils of six different types in less than five minutes, and we're going to raise the collective intelligence of this group by 15%. And only one of those councils is going to involve talking. All right. So right now, I'd like you to just get a baseline reading of your own intelligence. <laughs> so that after we've had the four councils, we can determine if we have indeed raised our IQ. Yeah? All right. Get a baseline. See how smart you are? All right. So, um, oh, I don't have a bell, but I'm going to, I'm going to, mm, yes, I'm going to make a little sound. I'm going to, I'm going to make the sound of a bell when we start this. So we could bring up just that first line. This is what we're going to do. So um, I'd like you to track the cycle of three breaths. 
So without trying to make your breath any deeper or longer, just notice its natural rhythm where the in-breath begins, when it turns around and becomes the out-breath, in-breath, out-breath, like that for three breaths, starting now. Ding! Right. So uh, the next slide there. Okay, we just had an intra. No, not just just that one. Yeah, good. So that was an intrapersonal council, and I'll explain all these uh, in a little while after we've done our our four councils. All right. Now, I'm going to ask if you could all please close your eyes and carefully, mindfully, come to a standing position. Thank you. All right, next, next little line. And the next little line. All right. Now, please uh, raise your hands, and we're all going to clap at the same moment. All hands up. Wait till all the hands are up. Look around. Are all the hands up? Okay, let's all clap together. Ah, uh, not good enough. Let's do it again. One more time, let's do it really. <sighs> yes! Uh, and now you can, let me see, does he say we should close our eyes? Oh yes, so close your eyes as you even more mindfully sit down, feel for your chair, return to a seated position. Next, li next uh, line here. All right, so I'd like you to think of someone who is always there for you. This is someone who loves you and cares for you no matter what you do, no matter how d well you do on a test or anything. Doesn't matter how well you do, how successful you are, this person is always there for you and it doesn't need to be someone who's currently in, in your life and it might not even be a person, but it's someone that you carry in your heart. And when you think of that person, you know that she or he or it wants the best for you. See that person. And now turn to the person next to you, and if this means making a threesome, that's okay. But see if you can just pair up, just look at that person in the eye so you know that that's part of your pairing. And if, it needs, if there's anybody left out, please make sure that that person is... Um, All right, does everyone have someone? So I'd like you to just take turns and just speak that person's name and name what the relationship is. That's all you need to do. Speak the name and name the relationship. Okay, go ahead. I can hear some very complicated relationships. <laughs> one name, one relationship, one name, one relationship. Great. So now all together, all together we're going to speak that name aloud into the space to bring them here with us. All right, thanks. So now please check in with yourself and see how your baseline IQ is doing. Mm -hmm. Another one? Next. And another one. Yeah. All right. I'm going to report all this back to my mentor. <laughs> so you're not sure? So I've got absolutely no data to support this assertion, but here goes anyway. I'm going to use terms from Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, the first council was intrapersonal, when we made contact with our own breath, when we brought a heightened awareness to the act of breathing, we were in council with ourselves. The second council was also intrapersonal, in addition it was kinesthetic. Why close your eyes to stand up? 
so we can bring heightened awareness to our bodies as we move. If we keep our eyes open, we might just drag our bodies along in service to the order to stand without engaging proprioception, the body's capacity to sense its own workings, to know itself. The third council was also kinesthetic, but this time it was interpersonal. What does it take for the group to all be able to clap at the same moment? Well, we have to notice each other. We have to bring a heightened awareness to the group. And then the fourth council was intrapersonal, logical, mathematical, visual, spatial, interpersonal, and linguistic. <laughs> These are tricks to my mentor. First, we had to look inside and consider who that person might be, the one that's there for us, no matter what. We had to recall people in our lives and make a choice of one that fit the requirement of one who loves us unconditionally. We had to picture that person, to see an image. Then we had to say the person's name and then listening to someone else as they spoke. So how does this make us more intelligent? Triune brain theory was developed by Paul McLean. He was an American physician and neuroscientist in the 60s. And he suggested that there were three evolutionary leaps for the human brain. The paleocortex, or reptilian brain, the limbic system, or mammalian brain, and the neocortex. We might also think of these as survival, emotion, and rationality, or gut, heart, and head. When we became aware of our breath, we were reminding ourselves that we're safe and we'll survive. Just like the reptile that determines moment by moment whether to flee from danger or to hang around on a nice rock and wait for an insect to eat, when we remember that we are breathing, we relax a bit and fear diminishes. It's why we tell ourselves to take a breath when we get upset or scared. It's the oldest part of our brain that comes into play when we're scared, fight or flight. Reptiles will drop and run after the babies are born, you know. What about us mammals? We keep them around for a while, sometimes a little longer than expected, right? <clears throat> At least as a metaphor, the reptile represents basic survival and the mammal is an emblem of nurturance, connection, belonging, and perhaps love. So how does this exercise of four councils in five minutes make us smarter? If we're in a state of fear, it's difficult to think straight. When a child comes to school and is experiencing any kind of fear, something that's gone on in the home, something they've seen on TV, something that happened on the way to school, or on the way home from school the day before, in the schoolyard, in the classroom, she won't be able to take in new information or perform well on tasks or tests. If we're feeling isolated, not belonging and unloved, it's hard to concentrate or be receptive. A child who does not feel connected to peers or to the teacher is not likely to be able to work cooperatively or produce creatively. When we do feel safe and loved, we're able to explore, make mistakes, learn. We can get in touch with higher brain functions. When we took three breaths, when we closed our eyes and stood up, feeling a mastery of our bodies, we appeased the reptilian brain, or in educational terms, we lowered the effective filter. When we opened our eyes and noticed others around us and all clapped our hands at the same moment, we soothed the mammalian brain and its need for belonging. When we named the people who were there for us and heard others do the same, we reassured ourselves that we and those around us are loved. This is how we become more intelligent. When we feel safe and connected, we're able to access the neocortex. And what's in there? Memory, language, everything we've experienced and learned, even when we weren't paying attention. We do better when we feel better, and we feel better when we do well. Creating a sense of connection, feeling good together, does not take a long time. When we take a moment to practice mindfulness with students, we'll help make them smarter. When we create experiences of collective mastery, when we feel connected to our peers, we'll perform better academically and intrapersonally. The brain is capable of rewiring its circuits and growing new connections after experiences of deprivation and trauma. This re rewiring is triggered, supported, through ongoing experiences of empathy, giving and receiving compassion, the well-being of the mind profoundly influences our physical health and the quality of our relationships determines our physical, emotional and spiritual well-being. So before you're about to administer a test, Try ringing the bell and have everyone take three breaths. Then have everyone clap at the same time. Make sure they get it, so do it more than once like we had to do, right? Till we get it. 
Finally, think of someone who loves you, has your back, is there for you, no matter how well you do. Ring the bell and pass a talking piece around your classroom. And if you come to a student who says that they can't tell them to think of you. Thank you very much.